Okay, guys, so the last time we looked into this, um, we were checking out how the Magna Carta established the rule of law over the king. So now we have a new pyramid, God, law, king, lords, knights, serfs over in England. Remember, England is different because it accelerates a lot like the people in the, or the animals in the Galapagos Islands being isolated for evolution. Here in a governmental sense, England is isolated and is able to evolve more quickly. So we have a new learning target. Um, this is number nine. So learning target is 4.2.1. I can define social contract theory within a state of nature. So today we're going to specifically talk about social contract theory, what it is and what it means. So social contract theory comes from this time period called the age of reason. Um, the Age of Reason is really a transition period in political philosophy, and it bridges from um, the Renaissance to a period of time called the Enlightenment, um, right around the same time as the American Revolution. So we're kind of in limbo here. We're learning some new things, and we're kind of rolling out in the 1600s. So um, it deals with a few different problems. One of the first ones is absolutism. Okay, that idea that the king is on top, on top and always. The next part that goes hand in hand with absolutism is the divine right of kings because God put the king on top and then it's going to conflict with some of these enlightenment ideals which say that law is on top and Government's job is to serve the people and protect their natural rights and LLP. So, if you don't remember what LLP is, life, liberty, and property. Okay, in the Declaration of Independence, we talk about the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So, um, what we really have to understand, though, is where does this come from? There's this idea that without government in the Paleolithic time period, um, as opposed to the Neolithic Revolution, we have this thing, and it's called a state of nature. It's basically darkness, and according to Thomas Hobbes, one of our big-time philosophers in the Age of Reason, it is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So, when we're looking at solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, we're going to use the um, abbreviation SPNBS, okay, in our future talking about the state of nature. So, in the state of nature, it is a big time dark game of King of the Mountain. Who is going to rise to the top? Who is going to have life, liberty, and property? And, oh, by the way, who's taking it away from you, or how are you going to protect it from that other person? Because if you can't protect it, they're going to take it, okay? There is nothing that stops me from being a large person, from hurting you to get your stuff and making my stuff bigger and better. So, here I've done some picture notes. With our dark game of King of the Mountain, we have Ninja King up at the top of our SPNBS mountain, thanks to Hobbs. And everybody keeps on trying to climb the mountain, but our Ninja King keeps on beating them, and they die and go to the other side, and his slice of the mountain gets bigger and bigger and bigger every single time. Now, if we're going to transition from our state of nature, we're going to want to transition within the age of reason. So here we have a picture of a political light switch, okay? In our political light switch, on the top is LLP, life, liberty, and property. On the bottom is SPNBS. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, in short. So what are we going to do? We're going to use our philosophers talking about politics. Remember the people's philosophy from Unit 2. And we have two guys from England, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. And they are trying to flip that switch from SPNBS, or the off position, to LLP, the on position, where government serves the people by protecting their life, liberty, and property. Lastly, we end up in the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is where the government serves the people 
and protects their LLP, life, liberty, and property. So in the Enlightenment, we have a light bulb, okay? And instead of a filament, we have our government ninja at, in the middle protecting our LLP from the SPNVS, solitary core, nasty, brutish, and short. You've got to remember this because Thomas Hobbes thought people were awful. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. New learning target, though. In order to do that, we have learning target 4.2.2. And it talks about comparing and contrasting. That's what C and C means. Um, Hobbes and Locke from the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. These guys are a product of their time period. And we need to understand how and why. So we have two English guys. Thomas Hobbes comes first in the 1650s and 60s during the English Civil War. John Locke will come second. He's in the 1680s during the Glorious Revolution. So we have two revolutions in England that happen right on top of each other. Thomas Hobbes believes, according to the English Civil War, that people are bad. Why? You're going to find out here in a little bit. But... He looks at the English Civil War and he says, you know what? The divine right of king and absolutism totally works. Why? Because if we have a social contract between the government and the people, the government's job within that social contract is still to protect their LLP. Who is going to be the best at protecting the LLP? That king of the mountain. Okay? And so if God put him at the top of the mountain and he's the best, why wouldn't we have divine right of kings and absolutism working within our social contract to make our big, bad Leviathan king, okay, to protect our natural rights and life, liberty, and property? We just have to trust him to do so. Unfortunately, self-interest screws this up every time. Remember, we didn't we talk about that like the first video? Okay, self-interest screws up government every single time it's tried. So... When he talks about Leviathan in the social contract, he's talking about a huge governor or monarch, okay? If you look at the book that he wrote on this subject, it's called Leviathan, which actually comes from the Bible. It's in the book of Job, and it's a reference to a huge sea monster, okay, was the Leviathan. And so it was so big that it was uncontrollable. And so... What he has as the picture for his book is a king that is huge, and he has a sword in one hand, and he has a scepter in the other, and he is ruling over the people with that scepter, and he is protecting their natural rights with his sword. And he is so big and bad that even his chainmail armor is made up of people in the picture. It's really kind of cool. Um, the symbolism in this artwork for the book Leviathan. So, his idea is, since people are bad, let's get a good king that is so big and bad, he is unchallengeable. Nobody is going up against this guy. Okay? So, John Locke sees it just a little bit different. John Locke says, we don't need a Leviathan. Okay? People are good enough to rule. Whose LLP is being protected? It's not the king's. The king already has his. Okay? It's there. The government protects it already. But all those little people underneath Leviathan in his chainmail armor, do they really feel protected? Or could they do it on their own? And so he says the people are good enough to rule. The Leviathan needs to be accountable to the people in his armor. So um, in his version of social contract, he is a product of our glorious revolution. Glorious because it was mostly bloodless. Okay. England got rid of one king, asked another king to come in, but said, hey, new king, we're going to give you the country and you're going to be the king and all that stuff. But, but you have to answer to the people. And that's where we get this idea of parliamentary supremacy, where parliament becomes bigger than the king. So now we're even taking our social stratification a little bit differently. God's on top. Then there's the law. Then there's parliament, then there's the king, then there's the lords and the knights and the serfs, okay, or common people. So, 
This also happens at the same time as the English Bill of Rights. You remember English common law from William the Conqueror? Well, they continue to want to define what that common law is and how it protected their natural rights. So they wrote their own Bill of Rights, much like the American Bill of Rights that outlines exactly what the English people got, okay? How their government would serve them and how their government would protect them from itself even. So we have that going on. And so for Locke, the social contract is going to protect your natural rights and your life, liberty, and property, LLP, through the consent of the governed. Okay? So we're protecting the social contract. That chain mail doesn't have to stay there. Okay? If the Leviathan isn't doing his job in protecting the chain mail, people, the people can take their chainmail elsewhere and protect something else, okay? And that's where we get into this idea of ROR, which is right of revolution. It is the grand escape clause of government. When government is not doing its job, then the governed, our chainmail armor, does not have to stick around, okay? They can unhook and go somewhere else, right of revolution, and decide to have a new government. 